All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to Comp 3350 Software Engineering One. We are uh, we're going to keep going with our non-technical planning stuff today. And um, one of the things that I want us to do is go through taking a look at GitLab. So some of you I know are your co-op students. You've been out on co-op work terms. You have probably done some kind of basic version control stuff using GitHub or GitLab or some other version control um, and project management system. But not everybody has, and that's totally okay. So what I want to do today is spend some time just stepping through the kinds of ways that I, I am expecting you to use GitLab this term. We're going to talk about using Git later. Today we're going to be focusing on using GitLab as a project management tool as opposed to a version control repository. You're eventually going to use GitLab as a version control repository, but for iteration zero, there's only going to be one file in your repository, and that's going to be your vision uh, document itself. Everything else that you're doing with GitLab for the for iteration zero is going to be about project management related things. So user stories, features, that sort of thing. Those are all the things that are going to be in GitLab. So I want to spend some time taking a look at it. I personally want to visit every team today to make sure that you have access to a project, that you can start making changes to a project, that you can start creating issues in a project. That's going to take a while. That's going to take a while for me to come and see every team today. But I, I think it's important that we are all able to do that. And with that in mind, while I am going around visiting teams, this is going to be an opportunity for you to keep going with the planning stuff. So actually taking the ideas that you've got, your visions, your features, your user stories, and starting to expand on that for your project for the rest of the term. If there's time left at the end of class, I'd like us to start taking a look at the non-technical plan. Uh, sorry, the technical planning artifact. So this is where we're going to be starting to look at um, how do we take the user stories and features that we've created and how do we put them into a schedule. And then later we'll be looking at how do we start organizing code. I'm not super anxious about getting to the code stuff because we're not expecting you to do code for the for iteration zero. But I don't want to leave it off forever, so that will definitely be something we're doing next week if we don't get a chance to get to it today. So uh, I've already said all this, so I don't really need to say this again. We're going to do not to finish up non-technical planning artifacts, and we're going to start looking at um, technical planning artifacts, time permitting. I want to give you all a chance to uh, to ask any questions that you may have about anything about the course before I move on to um, doing course material for today, though. So I'm just going to hold for 10 or 15 seconds of awkward silence. And if you feel brave enough to raise your, raise your hand, please go ahead. I'm counting Mississippis in my head. Yeah, OK. Great. So last class, last week, the last few classes that we've had, we've been doing a lot of really high level planning. We've been building these really, really high level planning artifacts. We started out with this vision statement, that single sentence that describes what our project is going to be at the end. So after we're finished everything, after we're finished coding all this stuff up, this is what our product is going to be. That is like airplane, no, that's like international space station high in terms of the, the level of detail that we have for planning for our product and our project. So we took that vision statement and we started breaking that down into smaller units, features. And our features are telling us what kinds of things do our users need to be able to accomplish. 
These are still really high level though. They're still like too high level for us to do anything with. They're great because they've given us the opportunity to take this big vision statement and break it into some smaller pieces, but they're still too big to be actionable. Actionable here means I, as a dev, so I'm putting myself in the shoes of a dev here. I can't just pick up this thing that we came up with. It says it's going to take about a week or two weeks to do. That's too much for me to even know what to begin doing. I don't know how my user wants to interact with that. So we want to take these big features and we want to break those down into smaller user stories. The format for user stories, I'm going to stick to the readings here. I'm going to stick to the same format that the readings are suggesting. A user story is an action that a user must be able to do to do a feature, to accomplish a feature, to be able to use a feature. One way that I can kind of distinguish this idea of features and epics versus user stories is uh, a feature or an epic is something that's kind of like a broad categorization of things that I might want to be able to do ultimately. And a user story is that very granular thing, the smallest thing that I want to be able to do as a user. Just like our features and epics, we want to include time estimates. The time estimates that we're including here are smaller and more precise time estimates. So they're not going to be the same level of Estimates that we had for features and epics, which was like on the week scale. Now we're talking about the day scale. This is how many business days I think that that it would take to accomplish this thing for me as a dev. And we're also going to include priorities that are determined by our user. So again, high, medium, and low. We've got three levels of priorities here. The priorities that we're choosing for these user stories and the priorities that we're choosing for our features and epics. These priorities are going to help us decide when we're going to do this thing, when we need to accomplish this thing. High priority is this is like what's part of what I would consider to be the minimum viable product. This is the core of this thing. I need to do it. So this is the highest priority thing. So I should do it soonest. I should do it first. The lowest priority things are, they're the things that are nice to have. They don't actually make this product what the product is. They don't make it uh, so that if I only, uh, if I go through this product, if I don't include this, it's not actually that important. It's still gonna work. It's still gonna do what it says it does, but it might not be as nice as it could be. User stories, just like visions, just like epics and features, these are written by our clients. They're written by users, so we're not going to be including any kind of technical details in this document. All of the non-technical planning artifacts that we're building are very explicitly about what this thing does. We have this vision for our product, all of these from vision statement down to user story are about what that product does. They don't tell us anything about how we as devs are going to build it. And it doesn't tell us anything about what it's even going to look like. We don't care about any of that yet. We're thinking about it. We, we can't stop ourselves from thinking about it, but this is not the right place to write those things down. This is not where we want to have that information. So let me write a user story here. So last class, I prepared this vision. I guess two classes ago, I prepared this vision for Notflix. I created this epic for Notflix that was find videos. Find videos by itself is a broad classification, a broad category of things that I as a viewer might want to do with this product by the time that I'm finished with it, but it's still too big to be actionable. So I want to change this into, uh, I don't want to change this story. I want to define a user story. So some smaller unit of work or some smaller thing that I need to be able to accomplish 
so that I, as a viewer, can find videos in my system that has a bunch of videos in it. So, here's the story that I'm going to write. The story that I'm going to write here is going to be find video find video by name. My epic is that I want to be able to find videos. That's very broad. There are many ways that I can accomplish finding videos in this system. Now I'm constraining this to, I want to find videos by this specific property. I want to find them by this specific property. I'm going to have the same kind of structure as my epic. I'm going to have a single sentence that describes how I, as a viewer, want to be able to accomplish this task. So, as a viewer, I want to be able to find a video to watch by name. The reason that I want to be able to find a video to watch by name is because my friend made a specific recommendation. How do you spell, oh gosh, how do you spell recommendation? Is it two C's or two M's? Two M's, okay, thank you. How embarrassing. I don't know how to write words anymore because I just have autocorrect for everything. Because my friend made a very specific recommendation. So I'm a viewer, I have friends, so this is not real life, right? I'm a viewer, I have friends, my friend made a very specific recommendation for a show. My friend said, hey, you should watch Andor, or you should watch Willow, or you should watch some, something specific by name. So I want to be able to find that video by name so that I can watch that video. As a viewer, the priority that I have for this is pretty high. I really think this is how I, as a viewer, am going to do most of my video watching, is my friends are going to tell me what to watch with a specific name. So I want to be able to find this video by name, and I want to do it often. This is what I'm going to be using this platform for mostly. The cost that I'm going to expect for this, so I, we can't take ourselves out of being developers. We can't, we can't. It's hard to do. It's really hard to do. I am, I, as, as, as a dev, I'm starting to imagine what's necessary to do this. There are certain things that I am going to be thinking about that are going to be one-time costs for this, this user story that I have to build. I'm building this one from scratch. This is the first story that my team is working on. So I'm starting to build this from scratch. I'm going to have to start to do things like build up my domain model. I have to have representation for videos. I have to have representation for... Uh, maybe user accounts, I have to have representation for other stuff. I don't need user accounts necessarily for this, but I have to have representation for videos. I have to have some kind of a UI to have like a text field to search for things. I have to have some kind of a UI to show those results. So I can start to think about these things. I've never done Android products before. I've never built an Android project before. So I have to do a little bit of research to find out how to do it. I think this is probably going to take three days to do. It's going to take me a while to figure all of that stuff out. So I think this is going to take three days to do. I'm eventually going to find out that no, it's actually easier to do or whoa, it's way harder to do than I thought. And I can make changes to this later as I want. That's kind of up to me to decide as I'm going through the exercise of building this thing. But for now, my estimate is about three days. This is a best guess at this point. 
if I'm building this later, I may be thinking about, well, I already have that video stuff set up, so I don't really need to build any of that. So my user story that looks the same as this is going to be a different cost estimate than what I might have uh, estimated earlier in the project. So my user story here looks similar in structure to the feature and the epic got a title, I've got a single sentence that describes what I want to be able to do, I've got a priority, and I've got a cost. The difference is the granularity here. So I'm talking very specifically about how I want to accomplish this thing as a user. Finding videos, I want to find them by name. There's no, there is no right answer here in terms of this is the right level for features and epics, and this is the right level for user stories. But what you'll find as you start going through planning exercises is that you may change things. I, I am going to keep saying this. You're going to change stuff. You're going to plan something and you're going to change it. And it's totally okay to make changes to things. This user story that I came up with, it's actually a bigger thing. It's an epic. And I need to break that down into smaller tasks and smaller units. That's totally okay. So I'm going to leave this up to the side. What I'm going to ask you to do with your team now is to prepare at least one user story for the epic or the feature that you created last class. If you, uh, if you didn't get your vision statement and stuff, there's three of them that I just stuck up here. Just come and grab it now. Stick them to the wall again. Stick them to the wall. The user stories that you should be writing should be on the post-it notes. Make sure that you have a distinction between the epic post-its and the user story post-its. But I'm going to give you about five minutes to do this, and then we're going to get all back together again. Please go ahead. Priority, all right so i'm gonna ask you to uh to just sit down like i said you'll have more time to work on this uh in a couple of minutes The, the one piece of feedback that I really commonly give about user stories the one piece of feedback that I really commonly give about user stories is that they are too big they're too big for what you're trying to do. A good indicator that you've got too many things in your user story is that you have the word and in there somewhere. When you have the word and in there somewhere, that usually means that that's actually two user stories. So if I want to be able to find videos by name and by category, that, that's two user stories. That's two separate things. I want to be able to find them by name, and then separately, I want to be able to find them by category. So those are two separate user stories. That's, that's a common thing that I see across all, all versions of this course, across all iterations of this course. The other thing that I uh, frequently say to students is, uh, as a user is a common thing to see in the, this is the type of person that is going to be doing this thing, try to avoid that. Try to make the, the person that you're targeting here a little bit more real. If you've done HCI before, you've probably gone through the process of making personas for, for who your users are. I don't want to get into that much detail because that's kind of more of an HCI thing, but we can make a little bit of effort to, to have these look like more realistic people by giving them a classification. So as a viewer, as an administrator, as, uh, I don't know, content manager or content creator. So, so that kind of level of this is the person that's doing this task as opposed to just as a user. Okay. So, like I said, I'm going to give you a chance to get back to more user stories in, in a few minutes. I just want to spend some time taking a look at, uh, at some other things. So I want you to have a little bit of an open discussion here right now. You're, you're in the thick of this. You've been working together on building these user stories. You're, you're probably still thinking about them. You, you can't stop. You just want to keep going with it. 
why though? Why are we doing this? This is from a project management perspective now. So why am I, think of me as your project manager right now, why am I asking you to do all of this? Why am I not just saying like, everybody open Android Studio, let's start coding. We've spent a lot of time talking about these things. So what's, what's this investment worth? We're spending all this time doing this. What are we getting out of this? How has this made your project better? You don't have a project yet. You all have a good idea, but you don't have a project yet. How has this made your team better? And there's lots of ways that this can have made your team better, but I'd like you to spend some time thinking about that. So I'm gonna give you about five or so minutes just to talk about these two ideas with your team. How has this whole exercise made everything better for you? Has it made it worse? It's okay for it to say, to say yeah, this made it worse, but I'm kind of guessing there aren't many good examples of that. Okay, so got five minutes, please go ahead and talk about that, and I'm gonna get some feedback from you. All right, so I would like to get some feedback from you about this. I, uh, I'd like to get some feedback about this. And uh, I'm going to pick on random teams. The first team that comes up on my random number generator here is, uh, is Team 13. So Team 13, tell us, how has this experience of coming up with a vision, coming up with features, user stories, how has all of this non-technical stuff made you and your project better than it was before? your foundation for what the project is about. Your, your team is in a unique situation, a somewhat unique situation, where you've got someone brand new on your team. And they've had about, uh, I don't know, 25 or 30 minutes to learn about this project. Do you think that your team has been able to tell you, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm really sorry to share this with you, but do you think your team has been able to tell you reasonably well about the project is? So one side effect of this is that, uh, and this is very much a project management thing, it's easier to onboard new people. So we've got this brand new person. We can get them up to speed fairly quickly with what this project is because we've been spending time thinking about it. Thank you, Team 13. My next, uh, my next pick is Team 2. So Team 2, tell us, how has this made you better? How has this made your project better? Uh, so, like this, like planning has helped us you know, be more organized. More organized, okay. I think that's probably related to this, yeah? Also, like, just we were saying, uh, none of us knew each other before. Okay. It was really good, uh, like, Team building. Team building, yeah. So you all know each other better now. And also like each team member is contributing to separate idea or maybe to see like a kind of like the same idea, but you know just some additional like you know input about it. Okay. So everyone is contributing. But also, you've all got different ideas. So one one thing that you are all learning about each other, yeah, this is a, these are good ice breaking activities. So I'm going to justify something to you. When I am assigning you all to teams, it is it is very literally Excel's random function. That that's how you've been assigned to your teams. I just like fill a row with the rand function call, and then I sort it. That's how teams are made in this course. 
when you are applying for jobs, you are kind of doing the same thing with the team that you're going to get to be put on. You get hired in a team, unless you're starting your own startup and you're picking specific people to be on your team, you're just going to be on a team with people that you've never met before. Getting the opportunity to, to, to figure out who those people are in a way that's related to work is a good way to get communication starting to happen, a good way to get you and your team to know each other and to feel more comfortable talking about this project with your team. I really like this point. Everyone's contributing different ideas. Some of you have done HCI. Some of you have done databases. Some of you have had co-op work terms. Some of you are maybe building Android apps outside of class. But not everybody here has done all of those things, and certainly everybody here hasn't done all of those things. You all are getting the opportunity to find out what each other are good at, what everybody's good at, what their strengths are. You're getting an opportunity to see things from different people's perspectives. We are building products for people who are not us. Having other people provide input to the way that we build that is, it's essential to making sure that we can build products for other people that are not us. Great, thank you team two. Uh, I'm gonna pick on just one more team here. So my last one to pick on is team three, it's team three. <laughs> team three. If you have nothing that you want to add to this, it's totally okay that you can say that. But is there anything missing from this list of things that you think has made you better? Okay. I'm going to prime you then. On the first day of classes, your team showed up. You were our, you were our dev team. You were our dev team. You came up with a project idea and uh, we're going to ask, if you came up with that project idea, do you think that you all have the same idea about what that was? Yeah, please say no. <laughs> <laughs> now that you've spent some time coming up with, thinking about how we're going to break this down into one, do you all have the same idea approximately of what you're building now? It might be still question marks, but you have at least one path through here where you have a better idea. Yes, am I, am I right to say that? It's okay to say no, but, but I'm suspecting that at least your level of similarity between your perception has increased compared to what it started with. So what we're trying to build here is a shared vision for the product. Everyone involved in these exercises is starting to have the same idea of what we're trying to build. Everybody's contributing and giving different ideas to what that's going to look like at the end, but we're all starting to have the same approximate idea of what this is going to look like at the end. Okay, I'll open the floor. Is there any other things that you think that we've missed here that has made you or your project better? Yeah. Better structure. So I'm going to stick that here with more organized. I think those are similar to each other. Better structure. I'm going to try and I'm going to try to describe what you mean in my own words, and then I'll let you tell me if I'm wrong. But better structure here. You're kind of saying you're actually starting to think about how this is going to be broken apart into smaller pieces, even like implementation, like this is kind of what this maybe is gonna look like. This is kind of how this feature is gonna look. So there's some structure to what you're building. Is that approximately what you mean? Yeah, pretty much like, kind of think, okay, I wanna get this done for sure. Yeah. Okay, so you're starting to order things too. Yeah. So it's not just, uh, it's not just better structure, it's also like ordering and planning. Ordering or sequence of tasks. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you for that. That's great. All right. Okay. Thank you all for uh, for participating in this discussion. Let's uh, let's take a quick tour of GitLab, and then 
I'm like I said, I'm gonna visit everybody. I want to visit every team here to make sure that you all have the ability to to work on your project. While I am doing that, while I'm going in the, around the room and talking to individual teams, your task is going to be to keep working on user stories. This is time for you to keep working on your user stories and doing planning for your project. So I'm going to, uh, to take a quick look at GitLab here. So this is what I see when I sign in. I see that a lot of teams have, uh, have started making their projects. I think these are mostly from the other section though, and that's okay. What I want to do is uh, to show you approximately what you should be doing when you're going through the process of setting up your project for the first time. So after you log in, you should see a screen that looks fairly similar to this. You should see something that looks like this. You, are, uh, you should have access to this group. You should have the ability to see this. Once you're logged in, you should be able to click on this new project button. I'm going to suggest that when you create a new project, you use the, the blank project as a starting point. I'm going to make this a little bigger. The project name, uh, what we would like you to do is have your project name be section number. So 802 dash your group number and then dash and then the, the team name that you've come up with. I'm just going to call this Franklin's project. For now, if you start from the winter 2023 group, so if you go to the group itself, you can click the new project button and this will be populated, but I'd like you to create this project in that group. So this is helping us, this is helping your instructors and your graders better be able to find the projects that you're putting together. You should set this to internal if you have the option to do that, but I will just go through all the projects and change them to internal at some point. This is me doing this manually. It's not on you to do it. If you don't have that option, don't worry about it. I will just do it myself. I have the ability to do it. If you have this option to initialize the repository with a readme, I would suggest that you do this. Just pick that option and it will automatically add the file that you're going to need to create. If you're uncomfortable using Git, especially, this is a good option to choose if you have this option because it's going to start making this for you and you can start using the web interface to do um, editing of the file itself as opposed to uh, using, your, using your text editor or using your um, IDE to do that. So after that, I will create a project. What I've got here now is this is the, uh, the initial readme that it comes with. To edit this readme in the web interface, you just click on the file name of that, and then you can open it in the web IDE. This will let you make changes to this file with, without actually cloning the project, without doing anything. You can just do everything entirely in the web interface if you want for this part of the, uh, this part of the project. I'm gonna go back to my project here. The next thing that I want to do is uh, I want to start working with labels and I want to start creating issues. The features and epics that we want you to build and the user stories that we're asking you to put together. While these stickies are great for you working in this classroom right now, they are terrible for me grading. I, I don't want you to like slide sticky notes under my door. I, I don't want that. We want you to create everything in GitLab as issues. So GitLab has this uh, feature called issues. I'm going to zoom out just a little bit. And when you zoom out just a little bit, you can see that this has just got a tab right there for issues. The first thing that I would suggest that you do is uh, click on list here. This is going to be the way that you start creating the issues. You can click on new issue to start making a new issue. Very nice user interface here. I would suggest that you use just a short title so that one to three words to describe what this thing is. This part here where you're actually writing the, the feature itself, you can put images in here. You can use markdown to, this, to write the text that you're writing. You can just write plain text. It doesn't have to be fancy. 
one thing that uh, that students that I like to use, I'm, I don't want to put that on you. One thing that I like to use in this interface is checklists. If you use this syntax, so it's an asterisk and then an open square bracket, a space, and then a closed square bracket, this turns into a checklist. So it's got like a tick box. And then when you look at this issue, you can just click on the tick boxes to finish tasks within the issue itself. So once you're starting to do this, you can use this to break your user stories down even further into smaller tasks that you personally need to accomplish with this thing. For assignments, you can see, uh, well, you, you should be able to see every, you should be able to see everybody. You got two options here. You can assign the task to yourself if you want to pick it up, or you can assign it to somebody else. This is how you are going to be self-organizing. You're going to have to make this decision yourselves. Is one person on your team going to say, this person's responsible for this, this person's responsible for this, this person's responsible for this, or are you going to independently pick up tasks yourself? That's something that you need to make a decision about. Due date is something that you can add if you want. Then labels is the next thing that I want you to, to start taking a look at. By default, there are no labels that you can attach to these, but I want you to use labels to distinguish epics and use end user stories. I want you to use labels to separate features, epics, and user stories from each other so that when I'm coming to look at your project, I can filter by epics and I can filter by user stories and I can just see which ones are which. So you can either create project label or you can click on manage project labels. I'm going to click on that one. When I get to the labels section, I would strongly suggest that you click that button. Just generate the default set of labels and it's gonna create like bug and stuff. As you develop code, as you're building code, the graders are going to be using these tags and labels to say things like there's a bug in your code somewhere. And they're going to use a label to say, this is a bug in your code. These are going to be the highest priority things that you need to fix for your, uh, for your deliverable. But then I'd like you to create uh, a label here for user story. This is a user story. You can pick a color if you want. Create the label. And then when you're at the point of creating issues here, if you're making a user story label, then pick the user story label to describe that this thing is a user story. There are other features that you can use in GitLab. So this is enough to get you started now. You should be able to create your project. You should create a readme. You should be able to create labels and issues. There are other features that you can use in GitLab if you want, but I'm not going to talk about how to use them. There's lots of things here, but the other two that I'm gonna point out specifically are these milestones and boards. We're going to be doing iterative development. You've got a due date of certain days for iteration one, iteration two, iteration three. These tools, boards and milestones, are tools that you can use to help organize your own things. These are the things that we plan to do for this iteration. These are what we plan to do for the next iteration and so on. I'm not gonna talk about these, but they are available for you to use. There are lots of other options in this, you are welcome to spend time looking at them if you want, but uh, that's kind of up to you to decide together as a team how you want to use GitLab beyond what I've shown you right now. All right, I think I got everything there. Labels, issue, confirms teams have access. That's my next task is to come around and see all of you to make sure that you have the ability to access things. So while I'm doing that, your jobs are to keep working on user stories, keep working on features, start working on iteration zero. So please go ahead and I'm just gonna go sequentially. I'm gonna start at the back and move my way forward to make sure that you have access to, uh, to your project.